Hey, family. I'm Stephanie Warday. I'm Habasia. Helping your brothers and sisters in Africa. Y'all, I'm just chilling to some Hadassah Queen O in the background. I decided to do something while I'm chilling with all of you. If it's this the first time you coming to my channel, welcome to my channel. And if you're coming back, welcome back. I appreciate and love all of you guys. I really do. I just got done looking at a comment. But y'all, before I do, I better do some housekeeping that I always forget to do. If you have not subscribed, please do, y'all. Give me a thumbs up. Hit that notification bell so when I upload, you'll know. And when you leave me a comment, please be respectful, but let you know that I appreciate all comments. And even if I respond to your comment as a subject of my next video, don't think I'm picking on you. Just let you know that I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to address the issue that probably more people want to know. Habasa is a 501c3 organization based in the USA, y'all, but we are very, very grassroots. We're functioning in Gambia, Jambon Jelly, at the Habasa Food Forest. And we are doing the best we can slowly by slowly. We got to go fund me opportunity for anybody who wants to donate i'll leave the information in the information box as well as in the comments down below when i'm done guys i do i really do appreciate everybody whether you donate you don't donate i appreciate your support either way it go but I tell you, money talks and what walks. <laughs> when people tell me something like, you should have drip irrigation, it's better. <laughs> All I can say is, yeah, that's nice, but we doing the best we can. We are blessed, and I mean highly blessed and favored to have that well. It took lots of sacrifice from many, many people who donated to the cause so we could afford to get that local well dug. Yeah, we had to get all of our resources together to dig that well. That well was dug before I went to the Gambia, but it still had some tweakings to do on it while I was there. We put out many, many appeals to our supporters for donations so we could finish that well. We needed a generator as well as a, a pump. And that also took raising funds. It's all of us working together to make all of these little things happen. That's actually big things when it's a grassroots organization. We don't have corporate sponsors. We're not funded by any uh, special interest group. We are what a real grassroots is. Y'all try everything. <laughs> to try to fundraise, including, look, this misspelled t-shirt. This is my sample. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, miss. 
misspelled sample. Now online, it looked correct. It was supposed to say is a signal. And online, it looked like the is a signal was underlined and everything. It was supposed to say Habasia is a signal. Something that Mr. Baji said it was. Some of you may know, Mr. Baji is our fearless permaculture leader. Very, very, very excellent and experienced teacher of permaculture technique in the Gambia. But anyway, y'all, some things are easier for people to say. And most of the time, the people that's complaining, y'all, have not donated one dime to the process. They haven't even shared a link <laughs> for the donations. And I know it's easy to talk, but I'm just appealing that if any of you actually want to see things out there like a drip irrigation system, you guys are welcome, welcome, welcome to donate funds toward that end. <laughs> Let me know in the comments if you're interested, and I promise I can get a answer for you as soon as possible on how much it would cost to install that irrigation system if that's something y'all want to fundraise to do because it's easy to do now anybody can fundraise for us all you have to do is when you're doing a gofundme type in habasia say you want to fundraise for an organization and you just simply click on habasia and it will pick it up under a GoFundMe, and you can say it's for the drip irrigation system for Habasia. And when you fundraise, the money will go directly to Habasia because it is a recognized nonprofit organization with GoFundMe. Or you could even do the same thing with uh, the PayPal giving fund. Yeah. I can put a link there for the PayPal giving fund. And when you go on there, all you have to do, you know, you t same thing. Type in a Habasia giving fund. You know, PayPal giving fund Habasia. Even when you buy things with PayPal, you can type in your favorite charity. And then when they say, what's your favorite charity? Say Habasia. And you will be able to donate from as little as $1 to the Habasia PayPal giving fund. So it's lots of ways to donate for that fund. And you can even donate to the GoFundMe account that's presently online that's there for our multi-purpose center where we'll be teaching permaculture classes as well as having a uh, sleeping arrangements, meaning rooms, dormitories for the men and the women. It'll be a multi-purpose building that's built right there on the land, the Permaculture Food Forest Project land in Jambon Jelly. So all you have to do is say when you're donating, well, I really want this to be for the irrigation system instead you mark this for the irrigation system and it will be put off aside for the irrigation system. And when we have enough to get started on it, we'll use your money toward that purpose. But otherwise, our first thing we're tr working on is the the, the multi-purpose center that's going to be Habasia House where we will have classrooms up at the top to teach permaculture to our volunteers as well as to the people in the Jambangeli community that want to learn about permaculture. And we will have dormitories there for the men and the women that's our volunteers so they'll have a place to stay when they're coming to our workshops there. Because sometimes we'll have workshops that's an all-day workshop and then you'll need to just sleep there so you won't have to be going on the highway late at night. 
But anyway, guys, I'm just so motivated to talk once I get those comments. So keep the comments coming, guys. It's a good stimulus for me. Um, especially when I'm already triggered by that misspelled t-shirt. <laughs> I'm going to have to go to Walmart and go to the craft department since Galveston doesn't have a craft shop, a hobby shop. I have to go to Walmart, look for iron on letters or something so I can iron on a black letter, <laughs> the letter I. I'll get one that's a little block iron on and cut out the letter I. <laughs> Good thing the letter I could just be like an up and down letter. <laughs> Guys, that's just something. You know, I've been watching different YouTubers as well. I was watching the Aphrodite's report and it was talking about women going to the Gambia, not knowing about the different modest dress code when women want to be respectful of a community that they're in. Because lots of people are moving there from abroad and they have no idea of what it's like to be in a Muslim country. But then they complain about how people treat them. So I decided to just address that issue today. And it doesn't mean that anybody has to adhere to any of it. It's just great information. That's all great information I'm sharing. So dressing for respect and modest dress, international, uh, we'll just say a modest dress guide for international, international women, you know, a dress guide for international women. And it also lets you know, what will you expect to see about Gambian women? Because sometimes people like freak out because they see things that they're not used to. Not everybody's will travel, y'all, just because they come from abroad. So just say, modest dress culture for international and local women in the Gambia. Lots of times, the reason is because Gambian women dress modest, modestly because it's one of the cultural norms, as well as it may also be expected of them and their religion because the majority of them are Muslim women. Sometimes they may be dressed in a hijab covered from head to toe. They may have one where it covers your face. Some of them where you just see the eyes, but it's normal y'all. They might be wearing all white, might be all black, but this is just some as they say, heads up so you know before you go. Because this is not meant for people that I already know it. <laughs> okay, here's a few of the reasons again why. So the one reason is that Islam is the dominant religion of Gambia. And Islam teaches women should dress modestly. Another reason is that Gambian culture values modesty and respect for women. And I think the more you say something, the more people remember. So that's just why I'm just saying it more than one time. And I'm also letting y'all know one more time, we're talking about modest international dress for foreign, foreign women in the Gambia, as well as local women in the Gambia just so you'll be able to be respectful of your host country being Gambia at that time. Modest dress is not just about covering up, but it's about respecting the culture and religion of your host country again. There's many ways to dress modestly in the Gambia. 
You can wear long skirts, loose fitting pants, long sleeve shirts. You can also wear a scarf or a hat to cover your head. Not necessary, just something that after a while you might consider a superpower. Because people will know that it's like, got you, sister. I'm with you. Anytime you have any questions about how I felt wearing my head covering over there or covering my arms up over there, wearing modest dress, necklines and all of that, long skirts, let me know in the comment. Ask me a question. I'll answer you. I promise I will. And I got a little bit more to say about modest dress in a minute. But I'm telling you one more time, bring loose fitting, long sleeve clothing with you. Pack a scarf or shawl to cover your head or shoulders. Cause who knows, you might decide you're gonna visit a mosque with one of your friends or go inside of someone's house that's a very devout and you don't wanna insult anybody, you know? Avoid wearing revealing swimwear in public. Not to say if you're at a guest house or a hotel, you can wear whatever you want to there. Nobody cares. You'll be considered a foreign a foreign woman anyway or international woman, so they're not expecting you to, to dress in any kind of way. But just say if you're on the beach, just say Sunday when all the family is there. If you're going to be there with the family and the kids, try to be mindful of that. And that day, wear like a beach cover up or something <laughs> while you're out there. If you're going to have a bikini under it, yeah, try to just cover up some. But now if you're at a private beach where the hotel is, wear whatever you want. It doesn't matter. You're at the pool, wear whatever you want. It doesn't matter. It's just a suggestion that you avoid wearing revealing swimwear in public. And I did get this information online. So I'm not making it up, y'all. <laughs> it says, be mindful of the local of the local culture and religion when dressing. Uh, so just say mini skirts and all of that. Uh, good for the hotel, good for your tourist areas like Sydney, Gambia area. But just be advised that when you're in those areas and dress like that, people may think you a passport granny. And that's the women that pick up these youngsters that's a bumpster <laughs> that's in those tourist areas. So you may get insulted in that area if they approach you thinking that that's the attention that you seek because it sends wrong what signals out <laughs> when you're dressing in certain kind of way. Most Gambian women wear loose fitting, long sleeve clothing that covers their body from head to toe. Again, it's considered Im immodest to dress and clothing that's too tight, too revealing, or too short. And this is all for the local women, not meant for international women or women from different cultures. It's also considered immodest dress to wear clothing that's too flashy or too colorful. And this again is for the women that's practicing Islam that's from the Gambia, the local women. Women should dress in a way that's respectful of the local culture and religion. Says, if you're unsure of what to wear, ask a local woman for advice or ask somebody who's been there a while. That's a woman for advice. Because I remember when I was at Debo House, somebody did ask me what should they wear because they was getting ready to go on a whole day of sightseeing and they wanted to know if it was appropriate to wear shorts i mean they asked me y'all i wasn't sitting on no 
pulpit trying to preach to anybody. Because who am I? Who am I, right? The lady was not or somebody that even looked like me. She was from Spain. And I told her, well, really, people would prefer for you to wear long, uh, long pants or a dress. And so she said, good, she will pack uh, a dress. And so that's what she did. She actually wore a dress when she was going to places that the dress was expected. And just say if they went to the beach, well, then she could just take the dress off and have her shorts. So she just made sure that she was not uh, being disrespectful. And I appreciated that she asked me, you know, because she did ask me how long I'd been there. So to me, that was really nice knowing that she actually did respect uh, Gambians enough to ask what would be an insult or not. And I tell y'all, when I'm in a Gambia, it's not hard for me to wear modest dress there because look at me now. I dress like this all the time. When I was growing up, my relatives wore head coverings all the time. Not every day, y'all, but I mean, pretty much. <laughs> we use it a lot of times as protective head covering at home before we went to sleep or when we around the house to keep our hair in order, things like that. And before we leave the house, we'll take it off. And then as I started evolving as a teenager, et cetera, et cetera, I started learning how to put on my African head wraps. And once I did that, y'all, it was on. <laughs> like I said, to me, a head wrap is a superpower. Seemed like I feel closer to my ancestors when I wrap my head and people ask me, how did you do that? And I just said, I just pretty much just put it on and I'm good. <laughs> it's no perfect way to wrap my head. And I remember when I became uh, a seven-day Adventist <laughs> in the United States, y'all. We wore modest dress then. I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So... I bought clothes that was longer, arms always, always arms covered, always. Uh, no low necklines, none of that. In fact, didn't even wear earrings back in the day. Could wear a watch, that's it, <laughs> for jewelry. And the married people could wear a wedding band. So, lots of rules, y'all, but... I actually didn't mind the rules. And as my, my uh, seeking, searching, doing my spiritual walk continued, I end up uh, practicing with the Hebrew Israelites in Atlanta. And what we wore, head coverings, whereas in Tulsa, the Seventh-day Adventists that I worship with, well, they actually get triggered. <laughs> yeah, triggered when somebody wears a head covering because they just wasn't uncomfortable. They weren't comfortable with that. I remember they, uh, one lady and her husband started worshiping at our, uh, our center, whatever, got meeting place. And they would say, she used to be a Muslim. She just need to go back to keep wearing that thing on her head. <laughs> so they was triggered by a head covering, y'all. Because we didn't wear head coverings. We were just wearing our head hair uncovered. And I just thought it's strange that it would trigger somebody to see someone else cover their head. Yeah, she was trying to give her 
the, the, one of the ladies was trying to give the lady who was worshiping with us back to the to the Muslims because she was c continued to cover her head. When I started practicing with the Hebrew Israelites at the congregation of the Tabernacle Israel in Atlanta, we even had names when we worshiped. So I was Shmula by Israel. So just say Shmula like a female Samuel meaning taught by God, God listens. How did I know? I researched it before I became a seven-day Adventist even when I was uh, at higher dimensions. So anyways, researching names is just one of my things, y'all. So anyway, I was Shmula by Israel. So Shmula, daughter of Israel. But anyway, y'all, we wore head coverings. We could wear jewelry, actually. We covered our arms. We wore long dresses. So, wasn't much difference again, other than we worshipped on well, not much different because when I was an Adventist, we worshiped on Sabbath. And when I was worshiping with the Hebrew Israelites, it was Shabbat. <laughs> same difference, y'all. Same time frame. But the dress was just a little bit different. Like I said, one group triggered by head coverings. Next group, everybody wore head coverings. Even the men wore head coverings at the tabernacle. All of them covered their heads. Okay. Even when I was uh, with the people that's Yahweh's in Rocheport, Missouri, I used to go and hang out with them at lots of festivals. And what do we do? We wore our head covered, but they was triggered by one of the ladies that covered her head and it covered her shoulders because she had researched that covering the shoulders was the way that the angels did. Okay. So uh, we overheard again, loudly, of course, because when you're in a group, people like to be loud when they telling you off because they think they saving your soul, you know? So they would be like, what she thinks she a Muslim? Covering up her head like that. You could wrap your head like this. Oh, they was happy like that. Because everybody had to cover their head, all the women. But you cover your shoulders too. They had a problem with you. So they actually accepted me and pretty much act like they didn't really care for her too much. I mean, they didn't kick her out during our weekend festival, but they weren't really friendly with her like they was friendly with me. And I pretty much looked like them. And she, I mean, I didn't look like them other than my, the way I wrapped my head, but she looked like them. And they still ostracized her because she covered her shoulders. So when I'm saying about people respecting people's uh, differences in, in culture and, and dress. It's just it's just interesting, y'all, how others see others and how you become uh, foreign or different no matter where you go in the world and that you have to understand when I'm with this group, this is what they expect of me. Just to <coughs> fit in <coughs> even if it's just a temporary fit whether you're going there just for a visit and surely if you want to live there you should learn some of the customs and some of the dress styles and let you know that 
people do treat you differently according to the way you dress. And that's no matter where you are in the world because what? People are the same everywhere. They are. People are the same everywhere. But I'm just doing this video just to let you be aware that when you anywhere in the world, you're going to have to figure out what's their dress code and decide if you want to be respectful of them. This is how you will have to dress minimally. And then if you don't, then okay. But at least you'll understand that maybe this is where some of this is coming from because it makes people feel uncomfortable with you when you're in their presence and they see you as somebody who's outright disrespecting their culture or disrespecting their dress code or trying to change them because of where you came from. So anyway, y'all, and wrapping it up, I hope this video has been helpful in providing information about the modest dress culture for international and local women in the Gambia. In fact, all over the world. If you have any questions, please let me know down below. I tell you, I try my best to fit in no matter where I go in this world. Like I said, I could be with the Hebrew Israelites when I go back to Atlanta. <laughs> if I was with the Seven Day Adventists, I'm good, y'all. I wouldn't have to change any of my clothes. I just, I guess, would be expected to leave my head covering off and just wear my afro. <laughs> so they wouldn't be uncomfortable in some of their worship centers. And I think some of the worship centers would be more accepting of uh, wearing a head covering especially if it was colorful and wrapped up and instead of uh, hanging down and covering my shoulders. It's just the perception of what they think somebody believes when they wear their head uh, wrap a certain way. You know, it's what value judgments, you know. Like, what to make it different that I'm wearing my head covering like this uh, when I cover my shoulders? Hold on. Yeah, guys, if I was in the Gambia and walking around with my head covered in the wintertime with this Maasai blanket, it would be no big deal. I'd be blending in with everybody else in the neighborhood and nobody even know that what she's not from here unless I open my mouth. But if I wear this same head covering and go back to Tulsa, Oklahoma with the seven day Adventists that I used to worship with, they'll be wondering why am I worshiping with them when I apparently must be Muslim because of the way I'm wearing my head covered, you know? So it's just a matter of people's perceptions. And I remember I have a, a picture where I did a photo shoot and my head was actually covered with a, a curtain. <laughs> and I was wearing the curtain and I just had my head like this, you know, kind of like this. And I looked like what? Madonna and child. So I really thought, it was different, you know, that how people perceive me as so regal and wearing a curtain on my head, a curtain, you know, like I said, just covered up with my head down like this. And that was it. <laughs> and that was from the directions of <laughs> James, the artist. Yeah, let me see if I could recreate that look, y'all, because I just have my aunt. Um, it's right behind me. You see on the wall, that is a curtain on my head doing a professional model photo shoot. 
So, like I said, it's all a matter of perception. So that's all it was, y'all. Like this. Kind of. You know? <laughs> that's all. See? It's just holding it one way, this way, and looking down. That's it. <laughs> that's all. It's just... It's all about perception, y'all. Sometimes it's just about lighting. So hopefully I've given you something to think about when you travel. So you can just fit in a little bit easier. Take a deep breath, relax. People are friendly when you travel for the most part. And I personally like it when my driver remembers who I am, because if they do, when I call them on the phone, they'll know where I am so they can come pick me up. Because most times, the place where you stay does not have an address. <laughs> and I personally don't want to walk all the way to the main road to flag down a taxi every time I need a taxi. And y'all, I'm not going to go all the way to Gambia or nowhere else to be uh, going to the places where I got to almost fist fight somebody to get inside of a taxi and get crushed. I don't travel broke. I'm not rich, but I, I save my money while I'm here. So when I go, I can call for my driver and he can come pick me up. He knows me. He knows where I want to go. Sometimes he reminds me of things that I might forget. It just makes life easier, y'all. It does. But I'm from the South. I was born right here in Galveston where I live right now. We're very friendly. Most people do know you here. And don't get paranoid. We grew up with you. I'm not going to remember your name unless I see you all the time. I'm always getting busted by people who be, hey, Stephanie, hey, Stephanie, and I will remember their name. But I at least let them know. I say, oh, I'm sorry I have a mental block. I don't want to say I forgot your name or nothing. But either way it goes, <laughs> they do remember my name, no matter how they look. They definitely remember my name. But anyway, guys, it's just the way it goes. Dress codes, perceptions. No matter where you are in the world, it's ever-changing, it's ever-flexible. Please just be mindful of how you may be perceived because of how you dress in a different country. And just decide for yourself what will make you feel more comfortable in a place and how you want to be perceived by somebody. Because when I'm in the motherland, no matter where I'm at, I'm treated like somebody's mama, somebody's grandma, somebody auntie. And I'm good with that because it's, it's comfortable for me because that's how they treat me right here in the United States. They call me auntie, ma, <laughs> ma, whatever. And I don't even be knowing these people. <laughs> Sometimes they see my face and call me the wrong name because I got their face that look like everybody. So anyway, y'all, it's all about perceptions and about wanting to fit in. You can always be paranoid no matter where you are in the world. <laughs> but remember, the people from the South are friendly. We just speak to people. Whether we know them or not, we're not ready to get in no fist fight because somebody say hi, hello <laughs> or they remember where we live. <laughs> you know, so all I can say is if you have any questions about modest dress in uh, Gambia, let me know. I can tell you about it or 
any other West African countries that I may know about, like Ghana, uh, Nigeria, Tanzania, Cameroon, those kinds of places you can ask me. If I don't know the answer, I will get back to you because I'll research it for you. But anyway, y'all, I hope y'all had a good time just visiting with me this afternoon <laughs> while I was all hyped up from this misspelled t-shirt. <laughs> that I have to go fix. And, and probably since I got energy, I can go look for it today. Oh, Lord. Until next time, y'all. <laughs> peace, peace. Power to the people. And if I get this thing fixed, I'll take a picture of it before I upload it on this internet. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> Bye.